Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We are so glad to see you, and we're glad that any precipitation has held off and you were able to make it to worship this morning. I don't know about you, but I was sure confused about the weather report. When I listened to the 10 o'clock news, it's the first time I've ever heard, and maybe it happens all the time and I don't catch it, but the weather person changed the, the weather forecast from the time that they spoke to the end of the, the, I thought, well that, yeah, I'll forecast, but I thought, by then everybody's made up their mind not to come to church tomorrow, and so I appreciate that you, you follow through and that you're here, so we welcome you. I invite you now to join with us as together we pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here and worship this morning, for you're a God who is sufficient and you're a God who is able. And so as we gather here, Lord, we gather here in excitement and, and a, with a receptive heart to hear from you. Speak to us today, Lord. Transform our hearts. Impact our mind. And Father, may our faith be strengthened as we celebrate and we worship you. Father, we invite you here to touch and transform our lives and our hearts and our minds. And it's in the loving name of your Son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. And together we say, Amen. Good morning. We welcome you this morning. I'm Brenda Weidman. I'm ministerial intern here at First United Methodist Church in Bella Vista. And all of you, we welcome in worship with us today. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us. We especially welcome you if you are a first-time visitor. And we ask, if you would, before you leave today, if you would fill out a visitor card, which is out in the narthex on the, on the central table, give us your name and give us your address. And with that, we will make a very brief visit and bring you a gift. And that gift will be a mug, which, um, which you can drink your coffee. And when you have your morning coffee or tea, which or hot chocolate, whatever your preference is, think of us. And in that mug will also be a, um, information about um, ways to be in service and fellowship and spiritual growth within this faith community. And we hope that will be information that you will, uh, will find helpful and you will come back and be with us yet again in the future. We also welcome those who are with us electronically this morning uh, across the airwaves, uh, those who uh, chose to stay home or, or need to stay home for physical reasons, whatever the case may be. The weather so far hasn't been a, been a problem, so we hope that it will continue to be that way, but we welcome you across the airwaves. Thank you for being with us this morning. Along the center aisles are red pads that contain attendance pads. Please be sure that those have been passed down your aisle. Um, and make sure that folks have signed. Not only is that helpful for us knowing who is here, but also it's helpful in knowing who isn't here so that we may get in touch with them and make sure that they are doing okay if, we, if they were not able to make it this morning. There are a number of um, events in the, uh, in, the, in the bulletin, in the ministry opportunities and events that uh, I'd like to draw your attention to. First of all, if you were hoping to come to the piano, uh, the project piano this afternoon, it unfortunately uh, will not be held due to the weather. So, um, so take that off your calendar and just stay home and be warm. We thank you for all of those who have um, turned in their commitment cards. Uh, and uh, if you have not done so, we ask that you prayerfully consider your commitment for 2015 and how you will grow closer to God during that year and return those to the church office soon. Thank you. Next Sunday um, in the afternoon will be our annual charge conference where we make decisions for 2015. And, if, uh, and all members are invited, and so we invite you to be a part of that as well. And last but not least, actually two things I want to mention. Um, uh, the, uh, the Calhoun family, I believe, is, is sitting over here, and, um, and there is a reception for them after this service. So we hope that you will join with them and um, uh, celebrate with them uh, the, the, the family event, the 78th uh, wedding anniversary of Wayne and RMA. So, so that's one thing. God bless you. 
And also, if you stay longer, there is a, a luncheon after, after that service, uh, after the, the reception. And um, in that, we will be honoring the granddaughter of Karen and Dick Bacon, uh, who is in, in a missionary in, in Lebanon. And uh, she will be sharing her story with us. And there will be some great food. So we invite you to join us for that as well. Let us worship together. remain standing and join me in the call to worship. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is here. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. We need your help because we need to sing to R. May and Wayne, don't you? I think 78 years, I just, I like R. May and Wayne to breathe on me. Because, uh, I mean, they, they've had a good time and we want to celebrate them today. So will you lead us?
Good morning. Good morning. Our scripture this morning is from the 25th chapter of Psalms, verses 1 through 5. Listen to the word of God. To you, O God, I lift up my soul, in whom I trust. O my God, do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuses. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and, tr and tr teach me. For you are my God, my Savior, and my hope is with, with you all day long. This is the word of God for the people of God. This time, if the ushers would come forward, we will continue in worship by presenting our tithes and offerings. May we all prayerfully consider the offerings that we will place in these plates, whether it be a monetary donation or the dedication and offering up of a gift or a talent.
a blessing in our lives. And as we come now to give these gifts back to you, we give you the thanks and the praise, and we give with joyful hearts. And we pray that our lives would be a living and a holy sacrifice, lived and offered to you, that we might share your love and your grace with others. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we enter into this time of prayer, we have several concerns and joys to be lifted up this morning. You will see uh, several arra flower arrangements up here and throughout the church, and um, one of the arrangements is in celebration of the 78th wedding anniversary of Wayne and RMA, and so we continue that celebration with them. There's also a basket of flowers in memory of Donna Hamilton, who passed away November 9th, and whose memorial service was held here in the sanctuary this past Thursday. Also, uh, flowers in memory of Pat Meyer, and her memorial service was held here in the sanctuary yesterday. And just continue to be in prayer for both of these families as they deal with this time of loss of loved ones and as they travel home uh, to where they are from, just continue to lift them up in your prayers. In Mercy, we have Harold Fitch, who uh, went uh, to Mercy last night, so please be in prayer for Harold and family as uh, he is in Mercy. In Home Hospice, is Jack Hunter, Pat Lloyd, and Vernon Walker. Continue to lift them up in your prayers and their families. And uh, several of the others that you see listed here in, in your insert in need of healing touch, those who are in nursing homes and, and care facilities, we ask that you would take this home with you this next week and just continue to uphold and lift them up in prayer as you spend time in prayer. And if you would like a more exhaustive prayer, uh, prayer concern, prayer sheet, uh, those will be handed out at the end of the service, and we invite you to take those home and uh, be in prayer for them this next week. And as you do that, we ask that you remember to please be in prayer 
for the Presbyterian Church as we continue to pray for churches within the Bella Vista community, that you would lift them up in prayer, their pastors, their congregation, their church leaders. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for a moment of prayer with our prayer song. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this time of worship. We pray that your spirit would fall upon this place and that it would refresh and renew us during this time of worship. That those of us who may be struggling through an illness or a, a pain or, or the loss of a loved one, that you would be with us. That you would give us the strength and the comfort we need. That we would be lifted up we would have your peace that passes all understanding and that you would be glorified through these situations. And we also give you thanks for the joys and the blessings that you have poured down upon us. And whether it be in the midst of good times or bad, that your praise would continually be on our lips. We ask that you would be with Brother Jamie this morning as he brings the message that you would speak in and through him that we would hear the words that he has from you and that our hearts would be changed this morning, that we would be touched, that we would be affected by your love. And as we leave this place this morning, that we would have a new passion for you, a passion and a desire to share your love and your grace and to shine your light with others. That as we interact with people this next week, as we visit with them or run into them along the way that we would just have a boldness for you, that we would share your love with them, the good news that you have brought to a, a world that is desperately hurting and in need of good news. We give you thanks for the gift of your son, for his love, his life, his ministry, for his willingness to come to this earth and to die for us. And we are so thankful that we now have the, the hope and the joy of eternal life as well. For death did not win. And we remember his sacrifice and his love now as we join together in praying the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, how be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Well, today, we're, as we prepare to think about Thanksgiving, we know that one of the gifts of Thanksgiving is the opportunity to spend time sharing our gratitude and our thanksgiving to God in prayer. It involves our prayer life. Uh, 
a big part of Thanksgiving is the, the, the fleshy side we like of, of the big meal or of whatever the meal is. But a spiritual part of the event of Thanksgiving is to share our hearts with the one who loves us and who, who yearns to hear from us. And so we involve, the way we do that is we, we pray in whatever way we do it. And our thanksgivings are varied. You know, we may be the only one at our thanksgiving table or, or there may be a table of ten or, or we may come here to the church where there are people or there may be two or eight. But somewhere a part of that day, even at that meal, there will be a time of sharing our hearts with the Lord in prayer. And so today we want to talk about prayer. And we're reading uh, in the Gospel of Luke and there Jesus instructs about prayer in fact, he, he tells a parable. It's a story. And he tells about a widow who goes before a judge. And so I want you to hear the outcome of, of how this all goes and to hear the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So if you've brought your Bible with you, I invite you to follow along. Or if you'd like to take the Bible that's in the pew, you, I invite you to do so. Or if you simply want to listen, I invite you to listen to the gospel this morning. And I'm reading out of the NIV translation beginning with verse 1 of Luke 18. And then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them, and I want you to, to get these words. To sh I have them underlined in my Bible. That they should always pray and not give up. That they should always pray and not give up. That's why he tells the parable. And then he goes on to tell the story. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally, he himself, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, have you ever been bothered by somebody? Pestered? hammered, the request keeps coming. Well, that's how the judge felt. He said, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't, she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. Did you know those words were in Scripture? To be worn out, it's there. <laughs> and the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? And will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice. And quickly, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is a word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, here is the burning question for the morning. And I've asked everybody the same question during the day. And um, I want you to be honest with your answers. But I'll let you in on something. I really don't want to hear your answers. Um, because this is personal. And this is for something for you to think about and, and, and for you to ponder. And that is, how is your prayer life? Think about that for a moment. How would you describe your prayer life? Um, is your prayer life active? Is it, is it constant? Is it, are you spending time in prayer, sharing your heart with the Lord? Because, you know, all that prayer is, is a, mo is a means of communicating our heart with the Father's heart. Sharing who we are, where we are, what's going on in our world um, with God. Or is your prayer life... Um, more of one who, uh, where you're, you find yourself praying when you're in times of trouble or you have need. Um, you know, you, you remember to pray when you can't find your keys and you need help. Or you try to remind God that you've really been good today, you've had a great attitude, so maybe you deserve to have that first parking place in front of the door at Walmart. Or you really want something bad and so you, so you say, Lord, help me. Some of you prayed that prayer today. You said, Lord, please do not make it snow because I'm going to church. Others are praying, Lord, please make it snow so I don't have to go to school. We pray. 
Or does your prayer life consist of allowing someone else to do your praying for you? You know, that, well, that preacher prayed Sunday. That took care of it. Or you remove your cap or hat and, and a prayer is spoken at a ball game at the opening and uh, you've prayed for the week. So I'll go back to my original question. How's your prayer life? God's given us prayer as a gift. And it's an incredible gift, the gift of prayer. And in that gift, God says to us as his children, I want to hear from you. You can give it to me. I want to hear about your joys. And I'm a big enough God, I can take care of your sorrows and your fears. I can handle your disappointments and your broken dreams. I want to celebrate with you in your victories. And I want to give you confidence when you find yourself in a place of darkness and you do not know whether to turn to the left or the right. I'm a God that heals when you bring your need of healing before me. I'm a God who can touch lives when you pray for others. I'm a God that that forgives sins when you bring your sins before me in repentance. I mean, that's what prayer is. It's just taking what's in our hearts and our lives and presenting it to the Lord. And really what Jesus is helping us to understand um, in increasing our faith and our knowledge to in the parable of the persistent widow in Luke 18 is allowing us to know that it's okay. In fact, God wants us to have a prayer life that is persistent. And it's disciplined so that it becomes a part of who we are and a means of our communication and of sharing our faith with God. A few years ago, there were some researchers that did um, a comparison research study of Japanese um, school students, early elementary Japanese students, with American students. And they presented both groups of students the same puzzle. It was a, it was a problem that needed to be solved And they were not concerned about whether or not any of the students solved the problem. What the research um, project was to um, discern was how persistent were the students at solving the problem. And so they they did a study over the students and, and how they solved the problem. And they discovered that the American first grade students, they were willing to give it a stab and they ultimately didn't throw up their hands and say, I don't know how to do this, till just a little over nine minutes. For nine minutes and plus, they, they, they stabbed at it. And the Japanese students, they plugged a little harder. They tried for over 13 minutes to solve the problem before they realized they could not or, or they had. Now, you may be thinking that the issue here is an intellectual um, issue that maybe one is smarter than the other group but that's not that's not the case the case the the issue is the ability to be persistent because the japanese students were willing to be more persistent in fact 47 percent more persistent than the american students and also there was a study done in germany at the academy of music by anders erickson and his colleagues uh, of students, and they also started out with small children. These were, were children that were all learning to play the violin. And so at a very young age, they, they trained and taught the children up until the children were eight. They went through the same um, process of learning to play, same practice times, same instruction m- methods and all. And at eight, the children began to make a few more decisions and and branch out and for the next 12 years the study continued to follow the students so that ultimately by the time they were 20 they could break the students down into three categories and the three categories were um, world-class musicians um, good musicians and musicians that would never play professionally I would have been in the third group I'll just go ahead and tell you. And uh, so what they, what they found in their research was the ones that were just okay, 
they logged about 4,000 practice hours. The ones that were, were classified as good, they found out they practiced twice as much as the other group, 8,000 hours. The ones that they, they really lumped into that special category of the elite, they practiced at least 12,000 or more hours. Now, both of these studies show that persistence pays off. And maybe in your own life, you, you've discovered or you've been told or reminded that persistence pays off. And so I want us to think of the word persistence and to look at Luke 18. And isn't persistence a word that you could use to describe the, the widow here? There, here she is. Um, continually, she's going before a judge. She has a need. Scripture does not tell us exactly what her issue is. All that we know is that she has an adversary. In her prayer request, her request of the judges, grant me justice against my adversary. What could the adversary be? Could it be that someone was kind of infringing on her property? Could it be that someone was calling and harassing her by the telephone? Could it be that she had a child that was in prison? Could it be? Could it be? You, you fill in. Could it be? We don't know. Scripture does not tell us what her issue is or what she specifically goes to the judge for. She just says, grant me justice against my adversary. Now, the judge is not a believer, not a, one who cares about God, and he's not one that even cares about people. And he finds himself getting worn out with this woman. He says, i got to go ahead and give her what she wants because she's wearing me out. You've been there, right? I hear parents all the time or grandparents say, I went ahead and did it because they were just driving me nuts. Well, that's where the judge was. He was just exhausted with this woman. And so he allowed justice to touch her situation because he was worn down and fragile. And so Jesus tells this parable and, and relates it to a God who is just who never wears out, who, who wants to hear our persistent requests before him, and who as a judge meets needs and touches hearts. I mean, the parable of the persistent widow is really a, a, a picture of persistence, of what it is to pray hard and pray through. Some of you, you've been in the church long enough that that you may be few, familiar with a term that we don't use as often as we used it in another day and time, and that's called praying through. You know, you don't give up in your prayer life, but continually you pray through. I, I read accounts of, of persons in our past who came to faith in Christ or, or discovered that an answer to prayer and somewhere along the line, as a description is given of this person's spiritual life, the, the word is given, they prayed through. That's persistent. To, to keep on praying, though there may be obstacles or roadblocks, or, or you feel like your, little, your faith is kind of going flat, keep praying through, ultimately knowing that there will be an answer. There will be a solution. There will be success in some way that, that the heart of God will transform and touch your heart in a way possibly that you never expected or imagined. And that's what this woman did. She kept on praying through. She was persistent. She wasn't going to give up. She wasn't going to be sidelined. She wasn't going to fumble. She was going to keep on going until her need was transformed. She prayed through. God has given us the opportunity to pray through. He is not a God who wears out like a person who, that's a judge and says, I'm, I'm so tired of hearing from you. Really, knock it off. You told me that before. But we're people that have, think God is that way, and so we approach God that way, and we say, well, I prayed over that yesterday. There's no use for me worrying about it today. 
Or God knows my need, so I don't have to speak it in prayer. But God says, pray. Share with me. If it's something that's involved in your life, then bring it before me. Because God is not an unjust judge like the one that Jesus uses in the parable. God is a just God. And he wants to hear our heart. I mean, prayer is ultimately a faithful measure to experiencing God. And who doesn't want to experience God, his presence, his power, his love, his grace, and to be transformed that. And in our lives, you know this, it's easy to give up on our dreams. I mean, we give up on that things will ever change. We give up on promises. We, we lose heart. We go weary. We lose faith. But that's all on our, our side of it. But it's in that constant, persistent, disciplined prayer life that our heart is strengthened, that our faith is built, and that our future is realized, that God is involved. Failure isn't about God. Failure is about us. Because God is a God who says, come before me. So one of the things, one of the ways that you and I can seek to have a better more persistent prayer life so that we do not become weary our faith does not fail or we don't lose heart it's to look it's to discover that in God's word he has made over 3,000 promises to us and God is a God who's faithful to keep his promise and so when we begin to to know God's word more and we encounter God through the scripture those promises begin to be more real for us so that in our prayer life, we don't have to separate a, a disciplined understanding of God's word from our prayer life, but we can intermingle the two because both overlap. And then the promises of God become a part of who we are, of our faith, and even of our prayer life. So then when we're faced with the obstacle in life, the unjust issue, we can, we can be surrounded in the knowledge that God is a God who is there. That he's with us. One of my constant, constant, constant promises of God that I can hang my hat on is 1 Corinthians 1, 9. God who has called you into fellowship with his son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is faithful. What does that one verse tell me? God is faithful. And his faith will transform my life because that's a part of my prayer life. That's why one of the reasons I can boldly tell you, every time we worship, when we go out the door, I say, what do I say? God is faithful. Past, present, and future. God is faithful because he tells me that. He reveals that to me in his word. Now, I don't know about you. Who were the instructors that encouraged you in your prayer life in the past? For me, it was some mean Sunday school teachers when I was in junior high. You know... I would have to go to Sunday school, and, and we would be there with them, and they were doggedly determined that we were going to pray, and we didn't want to. You know, 7th, 8th, ninth grade, you're embarrassed. We have the right words. But I am so grateful today for the determination of people that loved me enough that they opened up my faith and my world to understand how to pray. And the very Bible I used was given to me by a woman who taught me and influenced my life for prayer for good. And you know, this Bible is worn out. It's ugly. People think that poor man has no... He doesn't even have enough money to buy a new Bible. But I don't want a new Bible. In fact, one of the churches I was in, when I left, everybody thought I was so pathetic that they all gave me new Bibles. I got so many new Bibles from that one congregation. But the fact is, I don't need a new Bible. I've got plenty of Bibles. But this one I use constantly as a reminder of, of the importance of prayer and of the influence of someone that encouraged me in my prayer life and to know that God's a God who can be discovered in his word and that his word can influence my prayer life in an incredible way. And that's what God wants. 
Keith Pruitt read to us from the Psalms today, Psalm 25. And if you can remember, or if you want to look it up again, all he did was read you a prayer from Scripture. And that prayer can be a part of your own prayer life so that you can pray through even when you don't have words to use. Prayer has been given to us as a gift. And I tell you what, when you allow prayer to become really a huge influence in your spiritual discipline life, aren't we amazed? Aren't you amazed how it affects you? And so I want to close with a story. It's a story that happened just a few weeks ago in my own life. Uh, right before I left to go to Uganda. I mean, it was really just, I mean, it was a week before I left to go. For 12 years, I'd wanted something. In fact, I had wanted something really badly, but I thought it was unobtainable and out of my reach. It was a house. And finally, um, I made some good decisions that allowed me to have an opportunity to possibly get this house. And the family died out. Uh, it was an older home, and, and the house was going to be put in. A, it was in an estate that would be, be donated to the University of Arkansas. So I, I, I made sure I knew all the right people. I talked, and, and I walked around that house for a whole year. Every day, I'd go make sure it wasn't broken into and I thought, surely they're going to call the law on me one of these days, thinking I'm the intruder. But they didn't. And I'd walk, and I'd pray about this house, you know. Could it be mine? Would it be mine? How could it be used? And, and all. And I'll tell you what, when it was all said and done, I got the house. And I was excited, and people that knew about my desire for this house were so excited. But that week before I was to go to Uganda, I was sitting in that house that we were going to close on on Monday, and then I was going to fly out northwest Arkansas on Saturday. And suddenly it didn't seem right that it would be my house. It just didn't seem right. I mean, I hadn't put my house on the market. I still had a home. And I, I had worked so hard um, to make sure that stuff that was supposed to be with this house remained with the house. I mean, I had fought for it in an auction. I, I had been persistent with, with uh, the historical commission. I had done all those things. But I sat on a radiator in the house because it didn't even have central air and heat. And I thought, I don't think this house is supposed to be mine after all of this. And so I made a phone call and I said, you know what? I'm going to have to let somebody else have this house. I know I can't believe I'm doing this. And I know y'all because I was the persistent widow who was knocking on the door constantly. I was driving people berserk over this house. But I gave it up. And by Monday, the house was sold. And there began to be an excitement in me for whoever bought the house the same time there was just a tinge of grief of letting go of a dream but not letting go of a house and then I was so excited when the people that actually were acquiring the house called me and they invited me to be a part of the process of their buying the house and getting to know the house and the history and, and those things I had fought for getting them back to them and ultimately, then two weeks ago, the new owner of I of the house, we went, we made a huge presentation on the house. And when they got ready to have an open house, you know what? They called me and even included me in our house. Now, would I have told you that's how I wanted that to turn out a year ago? No. But I know it was right. Yeah. And the only way I could have accepted that change and all is because I really believed that God could do far more than I could ever, ever ask, think, and imagine. And through prayer, he began to change my heart and my mind, not to be so fixated on self, but to be, to be open to what God can do that was beyond me. And that's the outcome of prayer. 
being transformed by the power and the presence of our God who's active, knowing that he is beyond and he's our just God who will meet our needs in unimaginable, unspecified, unthinkable ways, no matter what they are. So I want to close with the same question I began with. How is your prayer life? Father, thank you for the gift of prayer. You've given us the gift of prayer, and then you've invited us to even to be a persistent in our prayer life, to keep coming before you, to keep knocking, to stay on our knees in earnestness. To share our hearts with you, no matter what our requests are, to, to bring it before you. To offer you to you our adoration and our confession and our thanksgiving and our supplication. You say, bring it to me. Because I want to hear from you, my child. So, Father, I pray today and ask you, teach us to pray prayers of faith. To pray through. And to leave it all with you. It's in the life transforming and life giving name of your son. Our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ we pray. And together we say. Amen. This morning as we close in prayer. We're going to sing a, a, a hymn that maybe you love and maybe you don't. Um, maybe you know it and maybe you don't. It's hymn number 522. Leave it there. And it's all about taking it. Whatever we have to the Lord and leaving it there. It's about praying through. And I want to invite you to be a part of um, a time of prayer if you feel so led. Pastor Zach and I'll be here. Brenda, we're here and we'd love to pray with you if you feel led. Or if you want to spend time in the altar, um, know that the altar is here for you. If you'd like to become a part of this church family, we'd love to receive you here on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ and Savior, Lord of your life. If you never profess Christ, um, but you feel, you feel that it's just time to accept him as Lord and Savior. And if you've not been baptized, we would love to be with you in that process. Or if you'd like to visit with us, we are attainable to you for that. Or if you feel led to transfer your membership from another church family to this church family, we invite you to do so. I want to let you know that in, uh, earlier today, we, we've had some people join the church. And so I want you to be aware of them so that you can greet them. We had Dr. Stephen Carter and his wife, Paula, who joined um, Dr. Carter is the new staff physician at Circle of Life at Legacy Village at the Hospice Hospital. And then in the former service, at the second service, the well service, we had a young mother and her daughter, Jennifer Stucker, and her daughter, Zoe, who joined. And maybe, too, you would like to be a part of this church family. I invite you to stand and join with us as together we sing, leave it there, and offer our hearts to the Lord in faith.
God bless you. Thank you for joining with us this week in worship. And we're excited for you in this next week that continually you'll develop a life of more disciplined, persistent life in prayer. Join us for, as we celebrate RMA and Wayne and, and celebrate with their family. And that reception is in the parlor if you want to know that. And then the lunch is in Becker Hall and you're invited to be a part of that. Go now and acknowledge that our God is a God who's faithful. He's faithful in our past. He's faithful in this present moment. And he's a God who's faithful for our future. And his son, Jesus Christ, has gone to prepare all eternity to be mine and to be yours. We're told that in John 14. And one day he's coming back to be with us. And remember, don't simply come to church. But who are you and I called to be? Be the church. Have a great day. Thank you for being here.